In June of 2021, Krista and Bart Holderson were both in their early 50s, living in a quiet street in Windsor, Wisconsin. The couple had two sons, their eldest Mitchell, who lived away from home with his fiance, and a year and a half younger than him, 23-year-old Chandler, who lived with his parents. There is not much information available regarding the family overall, as by all accounts, they seemed to be pretty regular people, living regular lives. The quiet neighbourhood that they lived in was very friendly, and all neighbours knew one another, some of them even being friends with the Holderson parents since childhood. Bart at the time was working at an accounting firm, and Krista at an automotive dealership. The family would enjoy activities together such as fishing, cooking, and vacations at their cabin a few hours north of where they lived, a cabin that was built by Bart's father. In early July, Bart and Krista are reported as missing by their son who lives with them, Chandler. But things take a sinister turn very quickly, as the missing person's case becomes one of homicide, with Chandler being arrested and charged as the culprit. The state would have the burden to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. With no direct eyewitnesses to the crime, this trial was very much a presentation of the evidence against Chandler Holderson. But what I expect to prove beyond any reasonable doubt is that on July 1st, 2021, somewhere between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., Chandler Halderson murdered his parents. The story starts a week later, on July 7th, 2021. Chandler Halderson walks into the Northeast Precinct of the Dane County Sheriff's Office and says, I'd like to file a missing persons report. He told me that uh, he wanted to report that his parents were missing. Uh, I asked who his parents were. He said, uh, Bart and Krista Halderson. It seemed like maybe he was tired uh, as he was describing uh, the fact that he had not seen his parents in the pre since the previous week. Uh, it just seemed like he was slow to respond to some of the questions. He had said that his parents had gone up to their cabin which I believe was in White Lake, Wisconsin, um, that they had left the previous week. He had said that they had left with another couple, but he did not know who the couple was and had not seen the couple, just that they had left sometime early, what he believed to be early Friday morning. He said that they had left in the other person's vehicle because both the vehicles that belonged to his family were still at the residence, but he, I did not have a description of the other vehicle. She had helped his parents pack on Thursday, July 1st, and that they had packed their own bags. He had helped them, uh, had helped his mom pack her medication and had also packed for them some tools. And when I asked him specifically what tools he had helped pack for them, he said they were all for cabin repairs and they included a wrench, a hatchet, a bow saw, some additional saw blades, as well as two 10-gallon containers for gasoline. He had shown me a text message on his phone that he stated was from his mom, and he'd received that shortly after 11 a.m. on July 4th, and it stated something to the effect of, we made it, we're going to a parade, and we will be home late Monday or early Tuesday. At 11.04 and 23 seconds, Krista Halderson's phone texts Chandler's phone. What does that say? Made it safely can't get anything through, and yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade, and we'll be home Monday night, Tuesday early. Love you lots. The use of the last phrase, love you lots, with exclamation points, uh, that had occurred at other times in the messages with Krista and Chandler? Yes, it had. That was a phrase she used? It appeared so, yes. He stated that they had grabbed uh, several bottles of liquor, uh, he said the norm that they might take a bottle or two, which would include uh, a bottle of wine. He then went on to tell me that his father had grabbed a large sum of cash, about $4,000, and this was also unusual, saying that they would only usually take a couple hundred and that maybe they were going to a casino at this point. Were your parents gamblers? No. Um, have you ever been to a casino with them? No. To your knowledge, have they ever taken a vacation and with the with entertainment that is gambling? Not that I'm aware of. Did you ever know him to gamble? No. I could have given Bart a hundred dollar bill, and I think he would have gave it back and said, "No, we're not going." I don't 
ever think that he stepped foot in a casino as far as I'm aware. Tell me about his drinking habits. Um, when I was with him, if we had a drink or two throughout the whole weekend, that would probably be it. Sometimes we would go the whole weekend without having a drink, and it was never in front of Mitchell or Chandler. So at this point, the sheriff's deputies don't know what they're dealing with. These folks get up there and decide, now we're going to go to the casino for a few days. We're going to play hooky. Didn't make a lot of sense. They started talking to coworkers and realized these people had never no call, no showed missed work, which they both did on Friday. Did they crash their car? Did this other couple kidnap them? Where the hell are they? This was all of Krista's time off requests from uh, January 1st of 2020 through December 31st, 2021. Did Krista Halderson request to be off on July 2nd of 2021? No, she did not. Did she show up to work that day? No, she did not. Was that unusual for Ms. Mrs. Halderson? Extremely unusual. Krista was very conscientious and would text me usually a couple hours ahead of any start time to let me know she would be late or not in that day. No call, no show. I texted her a little before nine o'clock when it was apparent that she hadn't shown up. Um, that text was never delivered. I received a second text, I think around 2.30 or so, um, of another uh, uh, coworker asking if I had heard from her. Um, so around 4.30, 35, 440 or so, we drove over to their house to see if I could get a hold of anyone. What caused you to drive over to her house? Um, just because it was weird for her to not show up to work, and I was uh, living just a couple miles away at the time. Initially knocked on the door, uh, no response, so I peered through the front door window, like the side light. Um, didn't really, s I saw what appeared to be a table on its side. Um, no response, so we went to the garage door, checked to see if the vehicles were there, which they were, and then at that point, uh, Chandler came to the door. He had a bandage on his large toe. Um, not sh sure which side it was, but he had a bandage on one of his toes. Did he say anything about his foot? Uh, he said that he had broken the glass around the fireplace while playing with the dogs. Okay. Um, did he describe his injury at all? Uh, he just said there was blood everywhere. He gives this bizarre story of his parents leaving in an unknown car, going to a cabin with an unknown couple, with an unknown amount of money, for really an unknown reason. What good police do, and what they did in this case, is they start looking into the people who saw them last, who were with them last, who reported them missing. And in this case, all three of those things, the person who purportedly saw them last, was with them last, and reported them missing were the same person. It was Chandler Halderson. So what the police did, started to look into Chandler Halderson. Now, this is all occurring in the same 24-hour, 48-hour period. And what they learn about him isn't suspicious at all. Madison College student, he's about to graduate. He's studying renewable resource engineering, kind of a hybrid IT degree with solar panels, things of that sort. He's about to get a certificate. But things had looked bright for him. He'd recently been working at American Family Insurance. He's working from home like most of us the last couple of years. But he's working a good job at American Family Insurance. And not only was he working a good job, Chandler had just gotten a better job. He got hired at SpaceX. He was about to embark on a career that people in the IT field could only dream of. He's planning to move to Titusville, Florida. That's where SpaceX operation is down in Florida with his girlfriend. They'd rented an apartment. They'd bought a car. He was working with the Madison police and the Department of Natural Resources on their rescue diving team. He was a scuba diver working with the police. The only thing that was a bit odd is he'd recently suffered a head injury. What did you know about Chandler falling? He um, was running and slipped uh, down the stairs and then fell pretty hard and hit his head. 
What kind of symptoms was he reporting that he was feeling after that fall? Tingles in his legs, sensitivity to light, uh, severe headaches, weakness. He had a hard time lifting things and quite often would get lightheaded. Could he carry heavy things from what you observed or knew? No. Um, could he drive long distances, things of that sort? No. Um, was he able to travel? No. Fallen down the stairs, had terrible concussion, was una unable to move for the most part, had to wear a neck brace. He was permanently perhaps injured. All of those things threw police off from thinking it was Chandler. He had anything to do with this. And at that point, for all they knew, as sad as it is, Bart and Krista and an unknown couple were crashed into a ditch somewhere between here and White Lake, Wisconsin, dead from a car crash. So they started looking. At that point in time, I asked my wife just to get the address and we would drive there uh, to their cabin to see how they were doing or if they needed help. There was a log over the driveway, so I stepped over that. There was probably, I would say, 12 to 14 inches of grass, so the grass hadn't been cut, and you could see that nobody was there. Um, I did walk around the cabin um, and look at all the doors, uh, and everything was locked up tight. There was external padlocks on all the doors. I had actually gone up to the cabin myself in order to check it out just to see what was going on. And why did you go to the cabin? Wanted to do something myself about it. Before the deputies arrived, I took a lap around the cabin myself just because I didn't want to wait outside any longer. Eventually, Langley County, I guess the deputies, I believe they were sheriffs and deputies, met us there. And eventually, I took another walk around the property with them, just pointing out things that I noticed. And also, they busted into the doors because they were all locked and the keys that I had were not working. Okay, and what led you to be, being so concerned? Not having heard from them, not being able to get a hold of them, and not being told that they had gone up there to begin with. So during this time period that you learned they're missing, did you reach out to your mom or dad via text or phone calls? Yes. Did you hear anything back? No. And did that concern you? Yes. Okay. And what were your parents' habits um, about keeping in touch or not keeping in touch with you um, in connection when they went to the cabin? My mom would reach out any chance she could, so she would, she would have told me. Did your parents tell you in the last week of June or the very beginning of July any idea that they may be going to the cabin? No. Nobody inside and nothing looks like it's disturbed. Um, but if you want to take a look with us, because you might know better if um, anything looks out of the ordinary. I don't want to look in the boathouse just to see. Okay. If yeah. um, if you're cool with it, I mean, we can uh, just the same thing, try to just pop the latch off. And, That'd be great. There okay. were, I saw... The Langley County Sheriff's Department is searching a cabin. No one had ever been there. It didn't look like anyone had been there at all in years. It was run down. The grass hadn't been mowed. There was no food in the refrigerator. No one had been there. So the police expand their search, and they start talking to not only just Chandler, people about Chandler. They start talking to people who were with Chandler that weekend. Specifically, they talked to his girlfriend, a young girl named Catherine. She goes by Cat. We had a normal 4th of July weekend. We went out to my family's farm. We got a farm. There was a pool. We ate dinner. Chandler was having the concussion issue, and he couldn't really move his legs, and so he asked to use their pool the next day because he thought that was good therapy. So the police, what do they do next? They go talk to the person who owns the farm. And they say, was Chandler out here? And she goes, yeah, he was out here on the 4th of July. But you know what? He showed up the next day by himself. And someone was standing in my driveway, and it was, it was Chandler. Okay. So I opened the window, because he was kind of standing, holding his phone and, and looking around. And so I opened the window, and I said, I asked him if he was okay. And he said, yeah. And I said, oh, I said, are you here to use the pool? And he said, yeah, would that be all right? And I said, yeah, sure. Were you oh. expecting Chandler that day? No. Okay. He was telling me about his accident he said he was at a doctor's appointment 
And so he was talking to me about what the doctor had said and what was going on. He said it wasn't good, that they might have to do some surgery or something, and that he said he was having trouble like with numbers, and he said he got lost, he had to use a GPS. He's just like said his mind was kind of messed up and wasn't thinking so well. Dulce showed up, um, she'd come. I wasn't expecting her, but she had come to the house and she came through the house. We were sitting on the deck and she came and was like, what's going on? And I said, oh, well, I'm just chatting with Chandler here. We, we were talking and then after that he, he basically, basically excused himself to go swimming. And did he go by himself or did you go with him at that point? No, he, he went by himself. I was getting impatient and waiting, you know, wondering what was taking him so long. So I said, look, I, I'm, I'm going to go get in the pool. I'm, I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm hot and I'm tired and I, I want to go cool off. And she said, OK. So she went to go get her suit and then her and I I have this little riding lawnmower. When we drove up and I could you could kind of see no one was in the pool. I was looking for him, and then I, when we came up the hill, I had the doors open in the shed, and I could see through the shed that his car was parked on the other side of the shed. We were like, what's he doing? You know, what is going on? So we drove over to see if he was in the back of the car. Was he sleeping? What was he, what was he doing? Was he smoking weed or something? We didn't know. We used uh, a little car. Um, where we mow the lawn. A lawnmower? Yeah, a lawnmower. So I basically inherited the lawnmower that Papa used to use. And so we, you know, <laughs> like a two grannies going to. You, you were both on the lawnmower? Yes. Okay. Yes. Chandler wasn't in the car? No. At that time, when you're, Chandler, you're looking at the car, did you see where Chandler was right then? No. Did you know where Chandler was? No. What the heck? We're looking around. Where? What's he doing? Where is he? And, you know, Dulce was kind of upset at that moment because she's thinking maybe he's doing drugs or something. She was really upset. I just was hot and irritated and just didn't want to deal with it. And so I said, I'm going to the pool. So we left and drove and parked the mower by the pool. So you're in the pool. Um, when is the next time you see Chandler? She says, he's walking out the woods in that area. Now, at this point in the investigation, the police are out there. They're out on the farm. And she says he walked out over there. Yeah, he came up to the pool. And I said, hey, Chandler, I don't have my, I don't have a shirt on. Sure. Because <laughs> I, I go shirtless in my pool. That's kind of why I was waiting for him to leave, because I wanted to have the privacy to get in my pool. And he said, well, if it would be all right, I'd like to get in the pool. I'm, I'm kind of sticky and I'm hot. And so I said, OK. And so then I kind of turned and he got in the pool. and. He went to the east side of the pool, and we kind of went to the west side of the pool. Well, he didn't swim because he didn't even wet his hair. Um, he was like going underwater and, you know, put it on water on his body. And after he went and just splashed himself, then he get out of the pool. And at some point, does he get out of the pool first or do you? Oh, he got up first. He he was said he was in a hurry. He had to go. That Catherine was getting dinner or something, and so he was like on a mission and had to like let's go and and that and he got out and went to the car and drove off. Maybe shortly before noon on July eighth, uh, Detective Liz Allen came to my office. Uh, she said she had uh, just had a phone call uh, with the mother of Catherine Mellander, who was the girlfriend of. Chandler Halderson. We determined we needed to get out to that farm right away and search it. I went up into the grassy area. I can see you have a photo of uh, the farm there. You know, during my contact with uh, Crest, she did talk that she had recently seen vultures uh, circling over the property. And did that raise red flags to you? Oh, yeah. Why? Um, when a body or an animal or creature dies, uh, it starts going through some some changes. The microorganisms on there start producing different gases and it emanates an odor. Uh, turkey vultures can smell that. Um, and when they do, they'll start circling the area to locate where it's coming from. And were those turkey vultures over the wooded area at the farm? When I got there, yeah. 
there's a you know the stack of old logs sitting there, but to the right is where we could see what appeared to be two uh, tire marks going into the deeper grass. Did you follow those tire marks? Yes, I did. There was another area of depressed grass in all different directions at the end of it, um, sitting right there. You're standing near where all that grass was padded down at the end of the tire marks in the grass. You look over and you can see uh, more of the grass is like pressed down, uh, heading towards the woods. Was it apparent to you that this was an area that had been walked through or trampled in some way by someone or something? Yes. <clears throat> and did you follow it? Yes, I did. The vegetation had been trampled down. So it's hard to tell from this picture, but there's actually a downward slope here. You know, if, if the trees weren't here, it'd be a good little sled and hill for little kids. But there's like a downward slope that goes down into, you can see like a little brush pile uh, down there. Uh, more of the trampled grass that goes to this log uh, that goes across. Did you notice anything ultimately beyond that log at this point? Yeah. Um, the pile of sticks on the other side of the log, and uh, there was just something that wasn't natural under the sticks. Did you go check it out? Yeah, I got as close as I had to. Couldn't quite tell what it was right away, so I stepped over the log and got a little bit of a closer look. It just, it took me a while to process what I was seeing, you know. It, um, then, it was became obvious that I was looking at a human torso. Under dozens of sticks, bushes, and dirt, they found Bart Halderson. Now, when I say they found Bart Halderson, I need to explain that. They found a human torso. Someone had crudely chopped off the head, the arms, and sawed off the legs in the middle of the thigh leaving the underwear on in the beginnings of the pants. They rolled the torso over. There were gunshots in the back. This man had been shot in the back and chopped up. Police swarmed the place. Drones were in the air. Cadavers, dogs were on the grounds. Everyone's looking through absolutely everything they could, but it's a farm. There's a million places things could be. But one detective said, look at that in the woods. Is that a garbage can full of a tarp? It was, and I'll tell you that tarp was taken out, taken to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab eventually. Bart Halderson, Krista Halderson, their blood is all over it. Well, this is our last aisle in the hardware department. Yeah, it's right next to the farm department where we keep uh, tarps and some outdoor gear. And I'll just draw the jury's attention to maybe that center row Whereabouts is that person at the top of the screen in the center? Uh, that aisle is where the tarps are located. What are we looking at there? Uh, this is again up at the front entrance, um, and that would be lane one is the closest checkout lane there. And are you able to tell what the subject in that, in that transaction purchased? Uh, yes, it is. It's a six by eight silver black heavy duty poly tarp. And is there a date and time that this was all done at? Yes, July 2nd, 2021 at 7.21 a.m. The original shoe print you saw on the tarp in C2, and then the shoes that you got that were purportedly from the Halderson house, you were able to compare those images. Correct. The image on the left is a close-up picture um, of the question and impression. So for C2 IMP1, I identify the left shoe to have made that impression. Another detective said, that spot where Chandler was walking out of the woods. There's an oil barrel there, like an old fuel tank with a hole in it. That's right where the car was parked. So she peeks her head in. Broken saw blades, hand saws, scissors, tree loppers, all of them tested by the state crime lab, all of them covered in human flesh and blood of Bart and Krista Halderson, the murder weapon behind a bunch of boards on the side of the barn. At this point in the investigation, the police knew they needed to start talking to Chandler. So they do what police do. They bring him downtown. Hey Chandler, how are you doing? Not good. Good, good. Would you guys switch spots? Yeah. You want to sit in that red chair? What's going on? 
So you, you reported your parents missing. We got some information from you yesterday. Um, we've been following leads last night, um, working today to you know go through different things, um, just trying to locate them, right? Um, so I, I guess if you want to start with, let's just go back to to last Wednesday. Um, Wednesday. It was kind of a bad day. Okay. Why was it a bad day? Um, tossed the ball and I smashed the glass. Okay. With the dog. The dog's so, uh That, yeah, set my dad off. We tried to clean it up. Okay. I don't know about him, but I got injured. Um, but he was mad. He didn't really talk to me too much that day. You said you were injured. What type of injury did you I have? got a pretty deep hole in my foot. The reason it keeps bleeding is because there's glass in it. Friday morning, I woke up. They had left with the stuff it was all set out. Saw my ma's note. The note uh, stated something to the effect of, I hope you have a great day. And then it left a phone number for Pam. Um, and it said, just in case. Did Chandler Halderson explain why this note was left to you? Yes, he did. He stated that he had fallen down the stairs in the home and had hit the back front and back of his head, which resulted in a concussion. And he said also a small hemorrhage in his brain. His mom was very concerned about leaving him alone uh, for the weekend with no one else at the home to kind of care for him or make sure that he was okay. This note was left with Pam's phone number to have Pam, or I'm sorry, for him to call Pam if he needed anything while they were gone over the weekend. She texted me and asked me if I'd be around because she was going to be at work and Bart was going to be at the dentist on Wednesday morning. And just in case he had any issues, <clears throat> that he could call. And that was Wednesday, June 30th, right. 2021. Yes. At any point in time, did Krista reach out to you and ask you to, hey, be available during the July 4th weekend for Chandler? No. What would you do Friday during the day? I didn't do anything that I should have. I should have been cleaning and all of that. Well, the house seemed pretty clean. When I was there. You see all the dog hair? That, uh, that's got to be gone. It all comes along with it, right? Yeah. I believe that was the day Cat came over. What were your general plans that Friday? Do you recall? Hang out. Okay. Have a sleepover. Okay. Uh, were you excited about this? Yes. Can you read that message from Chandler to you? Don't rush. I have tons of chores they are having me do. You say, okay, and then you talk about what you're having for dinner. Maybe burgers, maybe chili. Yes. Can you read what Chandler sent you? We could do dinner tonight, and you can come over in the morning again and stay till Sunday night. Was it your impression from this message that Chandler was telling you that you would leave that night and come back the next morning? Correct. Did that message strike you as odd of coming over, leaving, and coming back? Yes. You respond, more talk about groceries, I'll bring spicy cheese and pickled uh, jalapenos? Yes. Okay. Can you read that? And now hydrogen peroxide because I stepped on glass. Is that the first you'd heard about any sort of injury? Yes. Can you read that last message? But for real, if your mom has an extra bottle, that would be great. And a Swiffer wet jet. Extra bottle and were you, was it your belief that he's referring to hydrogen peroxide? Correct. My blood was kind of on the floor, so I got the Swiffer I borrowed from Cat. I just tried to stop all the bleeding, but I, you know, it wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. So and that blood was all coming from your left foot. Yeah, left foot hole. I mean, we're talking. Are we talking massive amounts of blood? Or are we talking, you know, a little bit? Like describe. Um, it started as drops until I got to the bathroom. And then I got back to go grab my sock and some of the, the paper towel. And then I see the glasses in there, so I grab a tweeze and I pull it out. And then it starts squirting out. I think the worst was the that floor. That, like, it kind of, like, you know, like this lid puddles. Mm -hmm. It was 
wasn't good. What we got on the floor down in the basement? Well, that one, um, and then I go upstairs to the kitchen, and it's still going, and I'm trying to get my foot in the sink just to slow it down and pinch it, maybe. As far as the blood on your foot, um, how did you clean that up? So we we were talking, you got you had blood on... Swiffer wet jet. Okay, Swiffer wet jet. Did you use anything else? Hydrogen peroxide for the, the tiles and the hard floors. Um, just the big globs needed a little bit. But it didn't really help. Okay. It kind of just made a mess. Did your dad get injured at all when the glass broke? Did he step on any or anything? He sent me up. But I, I don't doubt it. When he gets mad, he's not thinking. So uh, we don't know if your dad got hurt? No. Okay. No. But my best guess is that guy reached in the fireplace and cut off his arm or something. I don't know. What's up? Uh, head pain? Do you guys have like Tylenol or something? I, I know you guys can't really yeah, offer yeah, anything like that. But like a headache? Yeah, we've been getting the migraines from all of the, the hits and stuff. Yeah, um, we can try and get you something. Like that. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to believe mom or dad's blood would be somewhere in the house? Have they been injured at all that you're aware of? Oh, my dad scratches his psoriasis till he, like, gushes blood. My ma's blood? Um, just from her bloody noses she gets sometimes when she wakes up. At the end of the day on Monday, I did go for the afternoon. I did go to the farm to talk to Cress and Kat's mom. I, um... Then I go up to have, you know, break down by the shed and they go swimming. Um, right by the swimming pool is the shed, so they're, they wanted to watch me, like, you know, break down and all that. So after I noticed they're just watching, I just walk over to them. Describe your breakdown to me. Uh, I actually cried. <laughs> Started kicking grass. Just doing the toddler tantrum shit. What were you having a breakdown about? You ever have your legs cut? Right. Yeah. No, I haven't. Just, okay. just. I don't even know if they're done eating like as bad as they they can be yet. So yeah. that's a. Uh, that's not fun. It's a symptom of nerve damage from the hit oh, to my spine, so it's okay. permanent. Okay. Yeah, you want an aspirin? Appreciate it. You bet. I'll drop my man. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Say Advil on him, right? Did you put him on, on your mouth already? Oh, there's my there. Yeah. Nope, I just got it. Uh, so the plum you want to grab? No, no. Is it, is it like, uh... I think it's time we start talking about what happened to your parents. Mm -hmm. Like the truthful version. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what? we have like 20 pages of writing. We're going to start with a clean white piece of paper for you to start telling the truth. Okay. What? Because listen, listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. Okay. Okay. What we... Listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know. But we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us. Okay, and we know the reason why. Okay, you need to tell the truth. There's... Listen, listen. You need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened. Okay, if something happened, if you were defending yourself or if you just uh, got fed up with stuff, you need to tell us the truth, okay? This is your chance to tell us why, okay? I'm not BSing you. Okay. So can we do that? Okay. They're okay. Um, what? Okay. What happened? Okay. Can, you know what happened. 
We're not going to tell you what happened. You know what happened. You were there when it happened. We're not BSing you, okay? When it happened, can I? We know more I, than you think we know. I understand. Okay. There's people that have told us things. We have we have evidence. We have proof. that more has happened, okay? So your parents never made it to the cabin, and I think you know that. I just have a few minutes to end up. Let's go right over here for me. Yeah. I don't get any in your pockets at all. Wallet. There's a wallet that you just put in there. Oh, thanks. Cat in the other room, she's vomiting information to the police. She says, you know what was weird? Is this weekend, when I was with Chandler, while his parents were at the cabin, I left the house early one day, on Saturday, in fact, Saturday, July 3rd, and she says, he told me he was gonna do chores that morning around the house. But when I looked at my Snapchat, I saw his location was in a weird spot. What is that? A screenshot of Chandler by the Wisconsin River. Why did you take this screenshot of Chandler's location? I didn't know why he was there, and so I was curious. Did you know where this location was? Yes. And how did you know where this location was? I'd been there before with Chandler. Okay. Tell us about it. Um, it's a little spot where we can park our, park our car and walk down to the Wisconsin River for swimming. I asked him what he was doing there. And what did he respond? He was going to pick up CBD and he was passing through there. Do you recall anything else from that conversation about what he said or why he was where he was? Um, he was picking up CBD for the pain. Um, he didn't want to tell me that he was picking up CBD because he was scared I was going to be disappointed in him. At 8.58 in the morning, when he was supposed to be doing chores on Saturday, July 3rd, he was in what appears to be a forest on the banks of the Wisconsin River near Prairie du Sac. The police took that, and they identified immediately where that location was, just based on looking at it, that's a bridge. Out they go. The drones go up, the dogs go out, the search team starts searching. They find the remains of Krista Halderson. Picture 125 is an aerial photo of, on the center of it, you can see where the body parts are located that myself and Kevin Gruber, uh, who are part of the search party, what we located. And let's flip to page 128. How would you describe Exhibit 128? What I had found for human remains. Okay, just a closer up view. Correct. Um, and at this point, did you think it was one leg, two legs, or something else? I didn't stick around long enough to figure it out. Sure. And why was that? Because it's gross. Fair enough. Exhibit 129, is that just a further zoomed in view? Correct. We found her legs. One complete leg then somewhat farther away in another bush, a foot, a thigh, crudely cut apart with appears to be hand saws, axes, things of that sort. No more of Krista Halderson that's identifiable to her will ever be found. She's just those two legs. Chandler really liked this location out on the Wisconsin River. He'd go there all the time. It's where he'd go swimming. When his friends came into town, that was the secret swimming spot. And one friend even said, you know what? Last year, he sent me a picture while he was out there. Kind of shirtless, hanging from a tree with a machete. I don't know. Didn't have a lot of significance at the time when the police saw it, but eventually someone realized the tree looks unique. And eventually, one of the detectives realizes why. Something clicked. It was the exact location he ditched his mother's remains. This kid was standing in his front lawn giving media interviews to all the local media outlets about the cabin and the unknown couple and the unknown car. He was going door to door in his neighborhood. My parents are missing. Can you help me out? Do you have any security cameras, by the way? But while he's doing this that morning, what's he Googling? Body found Wisconsin. Woman's body found Wisconsin. Wisconsin dismembered body found. Dead body found in Wisconsin. 
body found in Milwaukee River. He's starting to search because he's starting to get worried because the amount of police in his neighborhood has been ramping up and up and up because unbeknownst to him, they're finding his parents' remains. Um, a little confused. Uh, I got two squads parked right outside my house and they're not really canvassing, they're just kind of sitting there. Is everything all right? Yeah, I mean, they're in the area doing canvassing and they're also uh, probably doing a shift change right now, getting our second shift crew on around 3, 3.30. Oh, there's four now. Something going on that we need to know? Well, they're probably doing reports. They're probably doing shift change. Um, oh, any news about that, that blue house with the big cameras? The blue house with the big cameras. Is that the one across the street? Yeah, yeah across the street, kind of in the corner. It's a newer house. Um, I haven't I, talked to... I stopped by their house. Now, when I started, and I said the police were initially thrown off because of one thing, and that was this text message from Krista. And it's real. Made it safely. Can't get anything through, though. Yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade. Be home Monday night, Tuesday. Love you lots. Sent on the 4th of July. So the police started looking into that. And the first thing they found was White Lake. The parade was on July 3rd. Remember, the 4th of July this year was on a Sunday. So everyone celebrated on Saturday. And in the garage, under a shelf, in a shoe, wrapped in aluminum foil, was his mother's phone, along with her driver's license. That message on July 4th, Krista there is in pink, Chandler's in green. The message was sent from the Halderson home on July 4th. Chandler sent it to himself. How does this kid, with everything in the world going for him, promising new jobs, school, a girlfriend that loves him, willing to move across the country for him, how does this happen? It happens because none of these things are true. He wasn't going to Madison College. The WNA it's, uh, withdrew with no attempt, meaning that it, the class was withdrawn sometime, I think it's the first 10 days of the course. And then going into fall of um, 2020, mostly withdrawn with a couple Fs. Is that correct? Correct. Um, so after the fall of 2020, he was not a student there any longer from what you're able to, to glean for all these documents? Correct. I believe the end of that semester was uh, January 18th or so. And so we'd have to go back to the spring of 19 when he got a C in something called project management to find the last class where any credits were earned. That's what I'm seeing. He wasn't studying renewable resource engineering. The people at American Family Insurance, they'd never even heard of him. I found no record of that person working for American Family. What about as a, one of their contractors? Did you, ever, did you research that? I did as well, and we found no record of um, that person working as a contractor. There's no indication he'd ever even applied for a job, much less had any job at SpaceX. The apartment he told his girlfriend he'd rented and the car he'd bought, none of that was real. The Madison police, they don't even have a scuba diving team. Does the DNR have a dive team? No. Does the Madison police have a scuba diving rescue team? No. Has someone named Chandler Halderson ever been employed by the Madison police to your knowledge? No. And this concussion he apparently suffered, he did go to the hospital. And you'll hear from the doctor who was there. He said, yeah, he came in, he reported that he hit his head falling down the stairs. The patient had some um, residual neck pain, uh, so he was given a collar to go home with for support with instruction to follow up with his primary care physician and with the spine team that was on call. At any point, did you give Mr. Halderson directions that he had to wear it for a certain amount of time? Uh, I did not specifically give him that information, no. Did you tell him he was gonna experience paralysis? Uh, no, ma'am. At any point during your time with Mr. Halderson, did you tell him that he had a brain bleed? Uh, no, ma'am. At any point during your appointment with Mr. Halderson, did you at any point tell him that he had a brain aneurysm? No, ma'am. Um, at any point did you tell him that he had nerve damage? I don't believe so, no, ma'am. At any point did you tell him he had a spinal injury? Uh, no, I don't believe so. At any point did you tell him that he should not drive? Uh, I don't believe so, no. At any point did you ever say that he shouldn't drive long distances? No, ma'am. 
At any point did you tell him that he had a hematoma in his brain? Uh, no, ma'am, I did not. At any point did you tell him that he would have an inability to use his legs in a normal manner? Uh, no, ma'am. At any point did you tell him because of his mild concussion that he was gonna have to have a colostomy bag? Uh, no, ma'am. At any point in time, did you have to drill a hole into his head? Uh, no, ma'am. At any point in time, did you tell him that he was gonna have to have surgery where a hole would be drilled in his head? Uh, no, ma'am. Given what you're gonna find out in this case, you may conclude at the end of it, he never suffered any fall at all. What you may conclude is that it was all made up. Police started looking into all of these lies. Because how does a person who looks so promising, was able to convince so many people of his success, how are you able to keep this up? And they started to find things around the Halderson home in the email accounts of Bart and Krista Halderson, in the email accounts of Chandler Halderson. When they talk about American Family Insurance, Chandler had been claiming to work there for a year. But he never had any money. And his father was an accountant, so his father would ask him questions pretty much daily. Why don't you have any money? Why haven't you paid any rent? And Chandler spun an amazing web of lies. Did you email HR to inquire about your paycheck? Unless there is something that you are not telling us, they have had ample time to pay you, Bart Halderson. Again, on the same day, we have email number 18. Uh, the subject is payment, and it's from Chandler to someone named Tom Selznick at ProtonMail.com. Could you read the body of that email? Good afternoon. My name is Chandler Halderson. I was recently made aware of you taking my case. Can I have an explanation of why I haven't been paid yet? Thank you, Chandler. So June 11, 2021, Mr. Selznick emails Chandler Halderson uh, in response. What does he say? Hi, Chandler. I was given your case on Tuesday. However, I have contacted your payroll company and have determined a few issues. One, you are registered as salary. However, you are making an hourly wage. Two, for two months, the payroll company saw your name and dues as a clerical error. Unfortunately, you have been making 25 an hour when your salary states you should be making 61,000 annually. This is around a $10,000 difference annually. When I get in contact with payroll, I will show them exactly when you were switched and find out why there was a delay on your dues. Have a great rest of your Friday. Tom Selznick, Northeast Remote Human Recourses Manager. Email 10 from Mr. Halderson to Mr. Selznick uh, on the 17th of June now. What does it read? Good evening. I was hoping to hear the status of my check. Is there anything wrong or holding it back from being delivered? I recently had to go to the emergency room, so I will need my check ASAP. Thank you, Chandler. Good morning, Chandler. I will make some calls when your office opens to speed things along. I'm sorry to hear about your trip to the ER. That's never fun. I do appreciate your patience with this, Tom Selznick. I will be traveling to Madison, Wisconsin, Wednesday of next week for restructuring of the HR department. It seems there is a lack of communication to be resolved. I will hope to meet you in person and have a sit down on Thursday if you are capable of travel, Tom Selznick. Did they also have you research whether or not Tom Selznick was ever an employee of American Family? Yes, they did. And was he ever an employee or a contract employee? No. Why is the guy who's the human resources manager spelling the word resources wrong, saying he's the human recourses manager? It's comically fake. He emailed himself back and forth, trying to explain why he didn't have any money, and he forwards it to his dad. He had nothing to do all day because his job was pretend. And so he sat on his computer playing video games. And I'm not against people playing video games. I'm a People play video games. But every day, Mr. Halderson was able to wake up and find a group of friends to play video games with online, one of which was stationed in Germany. This friend was a guy named Andrew Smith. And how do you spell it? Alpha, November, Delta, Romeo, Echo, Whiskey. Okay, and your last name, Smith, common spelling? Sierra, Mike, India, Tango, Hotel. Give us a general overview. How often would you play video games with Chandler online? Almost every day, sir. At some point, you decided to come visit Chandler. Yes, sir. When abouts was that? Sometime during, uh, I think it was June, sir. Of uh, this past year? Yes. Had you ever been to Wisconsin before? No, sir. Okay. It's a long drive. 
up here? No shit. I'm, yeah. Yes, sir. It's okay. So everyone slips up. When you visited Wisconsin to see Chandler, you brought him a gift. Yes, sir. What did you bring him? I brought him a 20-inch barrel SKS. What did Chandler do with the gun? Were you able to figure out where he put it in the house? Yeah, he had initially, so if you would walk down the fly stairs in the basement, you would look left, there was like a little wood pile, and he had stuck it in the middle section there because it was, I understood that they might not be happy about having this firearm. So, but he had told me he was going to be moving soon to, to do a career in SpaceX in Florida. So he was just going to take it with him and move out there with it. The SKS rifle that was found about 100 yards from Bart, Bart Halderson's body. American family wasn't going well. So Mr. Halderson decided to get a new job. I work at SpaceX. This is messages to his girlfriend. I have a good feeling about SpaceX. I have a follow-up interview for Florida tomorrow. Shoot, sorry, I got the job. I have training next week over the computer and leave June 11th and start June 14th. Around the time it was supposed to start, did something happen that caused a delay? Yes. What happened? Mitch went to the hospital. Chandler's brother? Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And in fact, you were hospitalized for a period of time. Yes, that is true. Was your mom or dad, did they seem concerned to you at all? Yes. You kind of laughed there. Why'd you laugh? My mom was overly concerned. <laughs> How did she express that? Not as much to me, trying to not show me that, but I have heard later on that she called her best friend many times crying. Okay. Mr. Halderson uses that as an excuse to delay starting at SpaceX. It was a stroke of good luck for him, a stroke of bad luck, of course, for the family, but a stroke of good luck for him. But that only gave him a couple of weeks. So roughly a week later, when Chandler Halderson needs to think of a new lie to get out of the SpaceX lie, guess who ends up in the hospital, being doted over by his mother and his family with a supposed neck injury. This is Father's Day of this year. In late June, that's Bart Halderson in the middle, Mitchell on the right, and of course Chandler wearing a neck brace that no one told him he had to wear on the left. He had a brain bleed, a hematoma, that he had spinal damage, that he needed his head drilled open, that he inability to use his legs at all. Couldn't drive, people had to do that for him. That he had nerve damage, that he needed to get a colostomy bag. But most importantly, he couldn't go to Florida. The doctors had told him he couldn't fly. At any point, did you advise him that he should not fly in an airplane? Uh, no, ma'am. So suddenly this man, who was, for all intents and purposes, disabled, was being doted over by his family. This guy who was wearing a neck brace nearly every day in late June would have no problem just days later carrying large bags of ice out of gas stations to chill his father's cut up body in a freezer. And you'll note, no neck brace. And in fact, you'll note in this case, Chandler Halderson has never seen a neck brace again after July 1st, 2021. So the job lies are over for Chandler and his life. American Family Insurance, don't worry about that because he got this new job at SpaceX. And SpaceX, I can't go because I'm hurt. It was a perfect scenario. But there was one last lie that Chandler had to get out of. And that is he had told everyone he was going to MATC for college and that he was about to graduate. And the parents were starting to grow suspicious. Hello, my name is Daniel Spieth. I just spoke to Chandler on the phone earlier today and I will be handling this ticket. Unfortunately, I will not be able to hold the meeting until Tuesday the 11th at 10.30 a.m. If there are any conflicts, please let me know as soon as possible to reschedule. When the call starts at 10.15, I will send the link. Thank you and have a great rest of your day, Daniel Spieth. Daniel, that time will work. Please send Zoom details to my work email, bhalderson at bdo.com. Thank you, Bart. First of all, I apologize. Recently, I have had a close family member become infected with coronavirus. I will appoint a coworker to the ticket of Chandler Halderson as soon as possible. Chandler, call me at 9 a.m. tomorrow for further details. I apologize for any inconvenience. Daniel Spieth. Good morning. Chandler was recently informed his counselor was not going to be able to make it to her meetings for the day, so he gave me a call. I will be remotely 
conducting his meeting today. He gave me your contact information. Does 930 or 10 work for you to answer a call? Speak to you soon, Daniel Spieth. I believe Chandler is in a meeting with a potential employer until 10. Did he say it was okay to have the call without him? Bart Halderson talked to this person. When I talked to the advisor, he sounds just like Chaz on the phone. That is, of course, because Bart Halderson, when he talked to Chandler's college advisor, was just talking to Chandler, who had bought a burner phone. And police know that because they searched Chandler's bedroom. They found that phone. Now this kept going. The lie about going to MATC or Madison College was the most extensive. There were emails, dozens if not hundreds of emails, going back and forth between supposed advisors at MATC and Chandler, and then he'd forward them to his dad from people like someone named Alyssa Brandt, 64. Sometimes Chandler would spell Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T, sometimes just with a T and no D, depended on the day. But they all had the at Gmail address. Alyssa, I wanted to reach out since I have not received an email from you with tentative dates and times to discuss Chandler's account and student status. As you might be aware, this is causing issues with financial aid and insurance, but also giving me other concerns. Thank you for your prop prompt attention to this matter as we have been trying to resolve this for countless months. Good afternoon. Currently, we have a shortage of advisors, so the earliest I could make time for Chandler is on Wednesday the 26th at 10.30 a.m. Thank you for the update. I blocked the time on the 26th, but would also like to resolve sooner. My wife and I are off on Friday and could meet in person if it would help to resolve this. Alyssa, I have not received any updates for the call meeting tomorrow. I assume this is a call or virtual meeting, but have not received the dial-in information. Dear students, Keep watch for scheduling changes. We are short staffed today and there, there likely will be day and time shifts for your meeting. Good morning, is there a problem with my meeting? I have waited a long time for a meeting and my employers need my transcripts ASAP. Thank you, Chandler. Good afternoon, I'm checking to see if there's been any progress on the documents I requested. Is there any news? Thank you, Chandler. Sorry for the late response, I'm running around grabbing everything on my spare time. It's been a hectic day due to recent events. Thanks for your patience, Alyssa. Good morning, Chandler. You are not on the list to be picked up today. When was your meeting scheduled for? It was for today at 11.30 with Aaron Hoover. Dear students, I am taking the rest of the week off due to a family emergency. If possible, my meetings will be reassigned by availability and relevance. If you have any questions, please give our secretary, Alyssa, a call or email. My apologies, Aaron Hoover. Alyssa, this is unacceptable. We have been dealing with this issue for well over a year now. It has been costing us money the longer the delays have continued. I'm not sure of the professionalism of the advisors, but it sure seems like they will take off at the drop of a hat and it messes up the whole schedule. Chandler and I have both rearranged our schedules to meet with an advisor today, and I expect you to find a way to make that happen. I need to have a call with whomever is in charge in the next 30 minutes. I have been a student for over three years, and I will be treated fairly. Good morning. I canceled the meeting for today because of work conflict and emailed you a list of questions and documents I need. When do you think I will be able to pick them up? Also, when when I do get them, I have a few extra questions. Thank you, Chandler. The IP address used to create that Gmail account, is that the IP address of the Halverson household? Yes, it is. All of these were fake. Back and forth to himself and eventually to his dad. The Halverson parents had to have been growing extraordinarily frustrated. The kid wasn't getting paid, he was injured suddenly. His college transcripts aren't coming through, so he can't get a job. Bart called MATC, said, I'm Chandler, and I want some answers. And for 17 minutes, Bart Halderson, just before his murder, talked to a man named Omar Job. Hi, um, I'm trying to get an appointment scheduled to meet with somebody. Do you know, do you have a, uh, an Alyssa Brandt? that works in uh, that area or anywhere in the campus? Uh, what is the last name? B-R-A-N, I think it's T or D-T. No. 
uh, all the brands. There's no Alyssa with all the last names that I play. How about, does Daniel Spice still work there? S-P-E-I-T-H? Mm, no, it's not so at all. Okay, that should do it then. Okay, thank you for your help. All right, you're welcome. Bart Halderson, shortly after that, sends a text message. Text message that ultimately sealed his fate, which was a text to his own son. And it says, I spoke with Omar Job. Guess what was on Bart's calendar? On July 1st, he was supposed to have a meeting with the people at MATC with his son at three o'clock. Of course, that meeting couldn't happen, but Bart Halderson knew that. Chandler had obviously figured that out at this point. There was no way out of this one. You can't get out of this lie. And so the next day, Chandler Halderson wakes up on July 1st and starts messaging his girlfriend. 726, I hardly slept. 727, stuff hasn't been going well for me lately. Just trying to plan for the next thing to fuck me over. 751, I had a great future planned. It's falling apart. 104, just two hours prior to the murders. I overheard they might go to the cabin with their friends, but I don't know. Now, shortly after this message, Bart Alderson's getting ready to go to MATC for this meeting. Bart texts Chandler, I'm ready whenever you are. That's about 50 minutes prior to when he was killed. Those are the last words ever recorded of Bart Alderson. The neighborhood he lives in riddled with security cameras, never see him again. And after shooting his dad, Chandler texts his mom. Dad's phone died. Text or call me. And get sewed on your way home. I have an extra hour of work. She responds, K, I can, smiley face. Those are the last words of Krista Halderson alive. Neighborhood security cameras, the Haldersons didn't have one, but the neighborhood, a lot of people did. Show Krista pulling in, getting out of the car, walking in, she's never seen again until her legs are found out by the Wisconsin River. That night, what appears to have happened is Mr. Halderson took items from around the house and began cutting apart his parents. Saw blades covered in Bart and Krista's blood. An ax, Bart and Krista's blood. Handsaws, things of that sort, covered in Bart and Krista's blood. He cleaned the house as best he could, and you'll hear about that. But still, blood spatter found of Bart and Krista's blood around the house. And he had a plan. And that was he was going to burn the remains in the family fireplace there in the house. So it's July 1st. And if any of you remember, 4th of July weekend's pretty hot this year. People in the neighborhood thought it was a little bit weird that so much fireplace was going on. They smelled stuff. About five minutes or so later, all of a sudden, that odor of burning wood became a distinct um, odor that was more like in the line of uh, um, when I thought someone was um, like barbecuing a large uh, pork, like in one of these large uh, um, barbecue barbecue um, pits or whatever that can hold a whole pork, kind of became real strong, kind of uh, like a pungent smell to the point that I actually walked down my driveway half the distance and kind of looked up and down the street to see if anybody was uh, doing anything like grilling or something else was going on and I didn't see anything at that point. It was something burning of, of a meat or fats or something. And that night, a neighbor who had a security camera behind the Halderson home, way far away, was able to catch something. Because it was pitch black at night, it was able to catch just a little glimpse of all the windows in the Halderson house. We have an expert that's gonna come in who works with video and light analysis. And he's gonna tell you, he was able to figure out which window that was. It was the window by the fireplace. And for many hours over the course of that night, the light flickered. But in the early morning hours of the next day, been up all night doing this. Because you'll learn, you really can't burn human remains. Your home fireplace is not gonna get hot enough to do that. But eventually, in the middle of the night, the fire started going well. But that light at one point grew and grew and grew and it got very bright in one room. And then all of a sudden, the kitchen light came on and then all the lights went out. It 
don't know if anyone's ever taken a hot Pyrex pan out of the, the stove and put water in it, but it explodes the glass. The evidence in this case will show that what happened was the fire had gotten out of control, burning these human remains. Human fat was rendering out. It was igniting. So Chandler threw water on it. But when you throw water on your residential fireplace, you break the glass. And that's exactly what happened. Just above that broken glass panel, which is clearly shattered, you see the paint kind of bubbled off from the heat. But what stuck out to police right away was that little rock right there. It smells like barbecued pork oftentimes, or the grease that you would get from barbecuing a pork shoulder. And this is the smell that I associated with what I was gathering from inside that fireplace when I was down in front of it and working near it. I would not be able to make a determination while there if it was human bone or non-human bone. Do you rely on another expert to make that determination? I do indeed. So this is actually that little piece of bone that you guys saw in that other picture. This is consistent with cranial bone or bone from the skull. We found a total of 106 fragments of bone that were able to be identified. From those um, 106, 53 of them were considered to be on the cranium. When I'm saying cranium, I'm talking about skull and also mandible. And then we were able to identify 18 of them as hands, part of the hands, 20 of, 24 of them as dental fragments, and eight of them as vertebrae, and three of them as long bones. In addition to that, I had 124 fragments that I know they're bone, but I was unable to identify them. So we had a grand total of 230 bones, uh, fragmented bones that were found, um, again, inside the fireplace on the grate and also on the ash disposal area. Obviously, things weren't going well burning his parents' remains. So the next day, he knew his girlfriend was spending the night that night. So he spent the whole day cleaning. But he's sending her text messages, which you will see throughout the day, asking her to bring him hydrogen peroxide and a mop. Saturday, July 3rd. 2021. His girlfriend leaves early in the morning. That's the day she snaps that picture of him out by the Wisconsin River dumping off his mom's remains. July 4th, 2021. <clears throat> this is the day he texts himself. Spends the day with his girlfriend's family. Goes to their farm to use the pool. That's the day he says, hey, can I come back tomorrow? No mention of his parents. The next day, takes out the garbage in the morning. Who knows what was in that garbage can? He goes out to the farm to supposedly use the pool where he's seen walking out of the woods. The next day, not much happens, but he's not doing much. But be people begin questioning him about his parents. The next day, he drives back to the farm, throws a bag of bloody rags into their garbage can, and at 11.22, he texts his girlfriend that he's finally going to the police. The next day, he starts Googling body found, Wisconsin dismembered body found. He's walking door to door, asking about security cameras in his neighborhood. And at 4 p.m., they take him downtown, and they arrest him at 641. So that's the story. That's why you're here for a couple weeks. Chandler Halderson killed his parents on July 1st, 2021. You'll find the evidence in this case is overwhelming. I'm going to ask you to deliver a verdict of guilty, to finally bring some much-needed truth to Chandler Halderson. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Brown. The jury would be thoroughly swayed by the state's argument, and they find Chandler guilty on all charges, being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I'd like to make a note that at this point of the video, I've transitioned away from research and court testimony, and now speak from my own thoughts and opinions. There is a saying when it comes to writing, filmmaking, and observational documentary, which I believe really applies to this video that I've made. It simply states, show, don't tell. The power that inhabits each moment is far more potent when a viewer or reader has the privilege to experience experiences with little to no metaphorical handholding from the creator of the work. I do try my best to embody this saying when it comes to each of the trial videos that I work on, to show you impactful highlights and only use my own narration when necessary to convey exposition. But with this case, as you likely noticed, it was all show and no tell. 
Every time I found myself thinking that narration could sit in a certain spot, I'd realize that the prosecutor, William Brown, already had it covered, and my narration would have only been a second-hand paintbrush to his words. This I believe to be no coincidence. In my opinion, it's not only because William is a great prosecutor, but a storyteller as well. Usually in opening statements, I find myself zoning in and out, having to rewind countless times as I take notes through a distracted mind. Yet that did not happen here. The DA delivered not only a riveting opening statement, but maintained this energy throughout what could have otherwise have been a gruelling and boring trial, as it was weeks upon weeks of forensic evidence presentation. To further focus on the DA William Brown, his words during Chandler's sentencing hearing were particularly impactful, as he explained the difficulty of his job and how much he has pondered what the state should recommend in regards to parole eligibility. He pleaded with the judge to not allow Chandler the possibility of parole, as the future safety of the public could never be confirmed should he be allowed to walk the streets again. William would say that in many homicide cases he's prosecuted, the defendant has clear signs as to what is wrong with them. Abusive childhoods, drug addiction, mental illness, and because of this, there's at least the hope that fixing each specific issue could lead to reform within the person, and eventual successful reassimilation back into society as a productive member. But with Chandler, no one can ever feel safe around him. The man presented as a completely normal person for his entire life. No signs of any concern were ever brought to anyone's attention, and hundreds upon hundreds of people were interviewed to ask if they had noticed any red flags. So how can one ever feel safe around this man, when he resorted to murdering two people who were closest to him, because lies that he had constructed were about to be uncovered, and he did not want to deal with the discomfort that that would bring? The attorney states that many people have had to face uncomfortable scenarios in their lives have had to walk into their parents' room, principal's office, or meetings with their employer, and have had to face the uncomfortable reality that something they did wrong now results in consequences. But what regular people do is face those consequences head on. They don't choose murder. Because Chandler chose this violent option, how could any of his future friends, employers, or even children, should he have any, ever feel safe in his presence, when at any time, he could snap again. This is but a small summary of what the prosecutor said here, and if anyone does have the spare time, I would implore you to watch the full video. I'll leave a link in the description. On the topic of people who stood out to me, I'd like to put a focus on Judge John Highland as well. From his always eloquent and gentle way of speaking, to his colourful bow ties, and even that pierced ear, he oozed character unlike any other judge I've ever seen before. Every word that left his mouth was a pleasure to listen to. Let me inquire, Mr. Burkhardt, is the system working well for you? Excellent, excellent. Folks, uh, thank you very much uh, for getting here this morning. I need to ask you. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't see any other hands. Before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given, arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence, a doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. I could listen to him read jury instructions all day, hey. To add depth to his surface of charisma though, at a point during the sentencing hearing, the judge was seen holding back tears, choking up as he related the loss of Bart and Krista, to the feeling if he were ever to lose good friends of his that resembled the deceased couple, and his words here, to be expected, when sentencing Chandler, held a lot of weight as well. I cannot conceive of a way to fulfill my duty to protect the public that I serve were I to perceive that at some point in time, an individual who committed these crimes should be released back into that public. I cannot grant to Mr. Halderson the generosity of spirit and empathy that his grandmother has for him. Empathy which his own parents would surely have had were he just owned up to what he had 
deceived them about. I cannot say to the community here in this room or at large in this county that Mr. Halderson should have the ability to be reviewed and considered for release back into our community at any point despite his young age at this point in his life. The gravity of these offenses and the need to protect the public outweigh the potential that there could be that at some future point he should have presence among us. More emotion was seen from this man, a man who had never met Bart or Krista, than Chandler himself, at any point throughout this trial. A detail that Chandler himself would acknowledge when he had an opportunity to speak during sentencing. A moment that many people usually take the opportunity to lace their words with empathy, either false or genuine, as they plead to the judge for leniency. Your Honor, I want to take this opportunity to state my intent to appeal my convictions. If there are any lawyers listening and willing to take on my appeal, take a moment to please reach out to me. It's not that I do not have feelings. It's that I was warned to not show them due to the scrutiny of this case. Thank you. There are multiple recorded instances to show Chandler's lack of emotion regarding the loss of his parents. Out of all of his recorded jail phone conversations, not once did he express emotion that his parents were gone. On one occasion even, a family member would speak to him after returning from the memorial service for Bart and Krista, and that person would express to Chandler that they felt sad and upset. Chandler's answer to this was for that person to go and watch a slasher movie like Halloween. The man sat emotionless during trial, as horrific pictures of his headless father's torso were displayed. Images that shook the entire room, and he was unfazed. No tears, no turning away, nothing. His ex-girlfriend would say many times that she felt as though she were more worried about his parents, in that little period where people thought that they may still be alive, than he was himself. And even after he invoked his right to speak with an attorney during his police interview, after he realized it was all going south for him, later that day officers would recall him saying that no one knows the whole story and that he didn't feel bad about what he did. To be frank, I don't really want to spend too much time thinking about this young man because I really don't feel like giving him any more time on the stand, so to speak, than is required. His childhood, by all accounts, was shining. No abuse. Loving, supportive parents. Opportunity beyond belief. A life that many people would have appreciated. A loving girlfriend. Immensely supportive extended family. The list goes on and on. Sometimes the psyche of a criminal will intrigue me to no end, as I think about the ins and outs of how they work, and the why as to how they found themselves at a horror-filled point in their lives. But none of that curiosity exists here for me. I was discussing this case with my mother earlier today, on the day that I was writing these words down, and I'll share some thoughts from her, as she was able to look at this from an angle that I was incapable of seeing. She said, Life is difficult for some people. It's especially difficult for the people who struggle within ample and vast opportunity. He may have had it all, but with that could have come an enormous expectation and pressure especially having a sibling who was doing so well. Some people just aren't able to perform like others. He may have withdrawn from his courses and failed, not out of laziness, but purely for the simple fact that he was unable to do it. Some people just can't do it. They're not good at life like others are. It's easy for us to look at people that are unable to apply themselves and to call them lazy arrogant or spoilt. And for the most part, that all could be true, but we just never know. Maybe you're looking at a kid who is never going to be able to live up to the expectation that his parents intensely placed onto him. Maybe they loved him too much. Parents do that sometimes. They have this knack of thinking that their children are much better than they actually are. As a side note, a bit of a low blow there from my mum, hey? <laughs> and as a result of this accentuated love and adoration, they expect much more than the child is ever capable of. My mother says that she thinks Chandler was failing within a framework that had never supported him in the way he needed, and the only break that he could find was through lies. And once those lies had begun to unravel, he snapped, 
Like the incapable, low achiever, poor pressure handler he was always destined to be. Those are some thoughts from a woman much wiser than me, hey? And I do hear what she's saying there. I can, to a degree, entertain this theory, as Chandler's mother has been described by many as overbearing with her love, and his father firm with his expectations. But does this mean they deserved the brutal end that they received? Absolutely not. And because of this reality, I don't care to think about Chandler much more than I already have. One can try to understand the circumstances which brought this individual to murder, but it doesn't change the fact that his crime was horrifically unnecessary, his remorse non-existent, and his life a waste. Attempting to hide from what he had done long after the intensity of adrenaline would have worn off places him into a category of vile that is reserved for some truly despicable people. Within his week-long escapade of lies and deceit, he found himself yet again a failure as he left countless trails of breadcrumbs that all led back to him. The evidence against this man was so overwhelming that I had to be selective in what I included, otherwise we would have been here for hours. Things like the rifle's ammunition that was hidden within the basement wall downstairs, right next to a spot where spent shell casings were discovered on the floor. He had Google searched, looking at other criminals who had butchered their family members, and were able to get court appeals on their sentences. Rags covered in his parents' blood were dumped in people's bins whom he knew. That's just to give you an example of some of the things I left out. Usually when prosecutors say that the evidence is overwhelming in a case, I've come to learn that it's a bit of a stretch, and that maybe they have a fingerprint on the murder weapon, or something like that. But not here. In this case, the evidence is actually overwhelming. Moving away from the evidence, though, and more to the people that knew this couple. Did you have a relationship, or how, how did you know Bart Holderson? I uh, knew Mr. Holderson uh, through Chandler. Um, I would be at their home quite often, and he would, um, he would uh, show me fishing tips, or if I was cooking, uh, him and Mrs. Holderson would be in the kitchen. And we would have game nights quite often. And we would also um, play Mario Kart together a lot. What about Krista? Could you tell me about your relationship with Krista Holderson? Mrs. Holderson and I, we would uh, text often about what we're doing in our lives and talk about the dogs and Chandler and like, we would talk about recipes and food we want to try and if I was cooking them something from uh, my culture, she would always be excited and we'd talk about it and always talk about game nights and wanting to do a girl's trip to Disneyland together. Did you like her? I did like Miss Holderson a lot. Did you like Mr. Holderson? Yes, I did. Every person that took the stand were clearly affected by the loss of their loved ones. It would seem that Bart and Krista could do no wrong, so much so that even the detectives that trawled through thousands of their text messages would say they could find not one single message where anything bad was said about anyone. The two always spoke to each other and everyone else with utmost respect, and they loved their sons endlessly, having countless conversations with friends and family about the achievements of their boys and how proud they were as parents. Quite often, people say that no good deed goes unpunished, and I really can't help but to feel it horribly applies here. These two people had spent their lives building a future for not only themselves, but their sons. Bart would go to his son Mitchell's house, where the young man lived with his fiance, and would help the new homeowners fix things up, teaching them how to do it themselves so they wouldn't need a handyman in the future. The man was renovating his entire home all by himself, and even building a wooden table from scratch. A dining table. He would say that he wants this table to be in the family for all time, so that when he and his wife are old, they can sit around it with their sons and grandchildren, and have family dinners together. Krista was described by many as the most positive person they had ever met. One would go to her for a pep talk, a hug, or even some Tylenol. She would always be excited to speak to people, 
and the room would light up with energy when she walked in. She had meticulously saved everything from Chandler and Mitchell's childhood in little bins that she kept in the basement, Legos that she had planned to give to future grandchildren, awards that the boys had won, photos of their achievements, their journey through the Eagle Scouts. It was like a treasure room dedicated to her boys' lives. The couple were known to love nature, farmers' markets, and had dreams to explore the United States after retirement. I hear people say all the time that life is unfair, usually applied to situations like a broken bone or a relationship that didn't work out. But the impact of these words is really hitting me hard whilst working on this case. It's unfair that two people who had worked hard their entire life to build a future, to support their children and grandchildren, never had the opportunity to see that family life that they dreamed of come to fruition. It is unfair that the future grandchildren will never get to meet these two people that would have unconditionally loved them. And it is especially unfair that their dire fate was brought on by one that they loved dearly. Someone whom everyone said, had he had come clean about his lies, sure they would have been upset, but would have done everything that they could have to help him get his life back on track. These two people did not deserve anything remotely close to what befell them. And I hope that in time, the pain of their loss lessens for the ones who mourn their deaths, leaving all that remains to be memories which bring joy. Joy at the knowledge that for a period of time, they had the pleasure of existing alongside these two people. <laughs>